Knight takes d5, there's this stunning tactical resource, which is knight takes f7. The idea is that they're forced to play king takes f7. Mm, and man. after a move such as, oh, I don't know, queen f3, queen f3 there, there are some problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's only one good move here, and it's a move which people are generally very reluctant to play. King e6. King e6, only move. And then after knight c3, we're in a, a new quandary, which is how do we retain the material that we have earned slash boldly taken without any work whatsoever, um, and also not get checkmated with our king in the center of the board. Um, there's basically just one good move here, and it's knight b4. Um, knight e7, a lot of people consider this, and I think it, it may have been played even this year at, at near the top level, but only in blitz, I'm pretty sure. The move d4 is very strong for white, since they can't take it. Maybe a queen e4 check. Yeah. They're going to have to move their king and then lose this guy. Mm -hmm. So, bye bye birdie. Um, so that's why knight b4. But this is all like rather unpleasant for black. It's been analyzed to death. Even with computers, we don't know the actual evaluation of this knight takes f7 sacrifice, which makes it kind of intriguing. But there are much more um, relevant things to consider, such as knight a5. Um, so in this game, and in almost every game in this position, they continue bishop e5 check. Oh, I'm sorry. It, normally they play bishop e5 check here, but in this game they did something different. Oh. Um, the main line with bishop e5 is that they play c6, pawn takes, pawn takes, and then white has a hard time choosing a square for this bishop. These are the only legitimate squares, since, uh, if we take this, it gets taken back. If we go here, it gets taken by the bishop. If we play um, bishop c4, knight takes. takes yeah. But even bishop a4 is actually a blunder. I mean, not strictly a blunder, but it's it's pretty bad. For example, bishop a4, h6, knight f3, e4, and we have to play knight g1 here. Yeah. It's very sad. What's the winning move for black after knight e5? Um... <clears throat> Queen d4? Yeah, exactly, okay. queen d4. So then how do we deal with this? Let's check. Knight takes. And then knight takes, and they got rescued. Mm, true. But then you could follow up with, like, knight g4. Maybe? Or queen's hanging. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, Anyone who's uh, just joining the chat, welcome. Feel free to uh, queen say hello. Queen c5? Yeah, queen c5 or queen d5 are both winning moves. I like this okay. one because of uh, the funny geometry of the queen covering almost literally every square that oh, yeah. could possibly go the, to. The bishop's covering that square. Only these two at the back. Well, yeah, it's Even the bishop's it covering this. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's why um, bishop a4 is not so good in this position. And generally, people play a move like bishop e2 or bishop d3. But it's a little bit unpleasant. Even though white's up a pawn for all their finagling with the minor pieces, it's still not that great. So perhaps for this reason, Brunstein uh, played something interesting. They played d3. Let me just promote this line. So um, what do you think of this move on the surface? Well, it certainly defends the bishop, no doubt. Um... That it does. <laughs> and if knight takes, then those two pawns, you know, one on the C file and one on the D file, are pretty good together. The thing is... Oh yeah, and then the knight is kind of removed from the game in a sense. Because it really can't get any more action other than trading it for the bishop. But that's good, right? Because yeah. this bishop was fearsome for the first several moves and, yeah, and generally true. is in this opening. Like, you would want to trade that knight anyway. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sitting on the edge being a little bit useless. But getting those two pawns in the center, maybe not the worst thing in the world for white. That's true. Um, so generally they would take it. But the problem with taking this right away is that if we do a material count, white's just up a pawn. So even though they lost their bishop, their position is still very good. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, the main move here is h6. Um, I once played this position um, with black. I think the year was like 2013 or 2012. I only dimly remember the game, especially now that all my games are gone. 
Um, but anyway, this game followed the same path because after knight, knight f3, f3, it's a little bit different. E4. Yeah. Could you do something like queen e2? Um, queen e2 is an interesting move, but I think that probably they would meet it with queen e7 or bishop e7 even. Because the key of this is that after pawn takes e4, it runs into Hang knight on. takes c4. Yeah. But guess what? That's what Bronstein played in the game. Oh, okay. And this is why I chose this game to analyze, because it's a, a very interesting uh, thing that he basically just gave a complete free bishop, right? In this position... Um, seems like it. I mean, black has more developed pieces, and... Yeah, it seems well, completely center pawns, but like... They do have two center pawns for the bishop, that's true. But it, it does seem kind of odd that uh, Bronstein would make this decision. So... He ended up winning the game, and even with uh, modern computer analysis, this position is not clearly bad for white. It's not like it's uh, minus six all of a sudden because we dropped a, a bishop or something. It, it, it's like almost compensation. So what do you think is the, the form of compensation for this bishop? That kind of informs what we should do next. So let's try to uh, play the way that he did. So, uh, so our bishop, our remaining bishop, has an open diagonal that it can move along. That's true. But how is that compensation? That's just a factor of the position. Okay. Like, that was true um, in the first place, right? Yeah, true. Uh, the, if you kick the knight, where can it go? Did you just kick it? I mean, it could go back to a5. Or it could... Oh, never mind. It could go, go to, to b6. b6. Or d6. Yeah. And There's a problem with d6, there. though. The fork... Not yeah, that's E5, right. Yeah. If we play knight d6, it runs into e5, absolutely. Um, so maybe we could get some kind of development or some other advantage by attacking this knight. Um, what else is good about this? The pawns. What? They have oh, a lot of space. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So these are all relevant factors. In this position, they played queen d4. Mm, kind of makes sense. Yeah, it forces knight b6 because knight d6 runs into e5. Yeah. Um, and then he followed up with c4. That's explosive. This is kind of like an even more um, ambitious version of a structure that you often play with white. You often play these moves e4, d4, c4, right? Yeah. In combination. Um, but here, instead of like, for example, trading something for this d pawn and keeping a knight on d4, the pawn has already reached to d5. The queen is centralized. Um, white just has a ton of space. Even though they're down a bishop, it doesn't completely feel like uh, white's position is that bad. Like, what should black play here? Do they have any active plan? Maybe something involving the check you can give with the bishop on b4. But, I mean, you can't do that right away. Why cause, not? Because then you could develop with tempo. Knight c3. That's true. It's kind of like you both, you know, it's tete-a-tete. -tete. You know, you develop your bishop, we develop our knight. It doesn't really make things much better. Mm -hmm. In fact, after a move like um, knight c3, white has kind of a positional threat, and it's to trap the bishop on b4. Bishop b4 check, knight c3, and if we skipped our, if we skipped black's turn, we could play c5, attacking this bishop. Mm -hmm. So they would be forced to liquidate. I mean, we probably wouldn't do it right away since the e-pawn is hanging, kind of, things like that. Um, but anyway, it's an idea. The bishop might not necessarily be well placed on b4. In the game, they played c5. Um, but also very reasonable. There's a major long-term problem with the c5 move, though. It undefends a certain square. Like which? Like d6. So what does that give white? Oh, the ability to push that pawn eventually? Yeah, so it becomes a pass pawn, right? Yeah. So they just give a free pass pawn. But it's kind of understandable why they are under pressure. What was White's threat? It, like, for example, if it was White's turn again, what would White do? Um, C5, maybe? Yeah, C5. Yeah. And the knight has to go way back. Mm-hmm. In fact, it would probably be a, almost an advantageous position for white. Um, for example, if you play like, what's a reasonable move? Maybe like bishop e7, something passive a little bit. Then after c5, um, knight d7, 
e5. It looks like you're just getting pushed off the board. I guess here they actually have bishop takes c5, so uh, ixne on the e5 pay, but um, maybe we can prepare it with like bishop e3, or we can play d6. Actually, d6 looks pretty scrumptious. Oh, wow. This is reminiscent of terrible. the uh, Halloween <laughs> Gambit. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's this, there's this Gambit with white where um, it starts out in a regular four knights position, and then white suddenly plays knight takes e5. And uh, this is a, a somewhat popular Gambit. Um, like, for example, if you play knight c6, you just kind of get rolled. Why is it called the Halloween Gambit? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it really beats me. But... <laughs> Oh yeah, actually there's some historical anecdote about it that gave it its name. But probably it's just because people really want an excuse to call something the Halloween Gambit. Ooh, spooky holidays. Anyway, so anyway, c5 is what they played, and they just responded with queen d3. Nothing flashy. There's no need. And then bishop g4. Whenever um, one side has more space, it's very difficult for the other side to find useful squares for their pieces. Which kind of explains this bishop g4 move. It's not like that move is necessarily something you would want to do all the time. For instance, it's not pinning anything. Yeah, but it's like the only place to put the bishop. Yeah, except for d7, which seems maybe even more passive. Very passive. Right. Um, so we, excuse me, Grunstein played knight d2, this one. Bishop e7. Yeah. And uh, what would you play here? Um, it's between b3 and castling for me. Well, castling is what they did. Okay. Very reasonable move. Castling is not just a king defending move. It's also a way of activating your rooks because they're about, they're going yeah. to be connected sooner or later. So castling can often be a very active play. Um, so black castled as well. And then here, white improved their position with knight e5. Good move. It's an excellent move. Um, but let's see, is knight e5 like a, a forced move, or is there something else that's worth considering? Um, Bishop's going nowhere, rook's going nowhere. You could prepare, try to develop the bishop eventually. Mm -hmm. With something like b3. Is that why you were or... choosing that in the first place? Yeah. But. I feel like the bishop's fine where it is, to be honest. I'll I mean, it's not one. good, but it's no worse than it would be on It doesn't have good harmony with the, the, the major pieces, maybe. Yeah. Playing b3 um, and bishop b2 doesn't seem to clearly forward any particular plan. So maybe that's kind of what you're sensing here. Um, I was wondering if you would go in for it. Um, Rookie one is an idea. Well, it's a move, but that doesn't mean it's an idea. Like, why would you play rookie one? With the intent of e5. So, do you think that a, a general pawn advance is, like, white's strategic plan overall? No, actually, that's a good point. Because they already have their pawns doing a great job where they are. So that means you don't want to do it anymore and you want to do something else? Because <laughs> if they're um, already doing a great job, why not let them do an even better job? Yeah, that's true. Usually, when you have some kind of advantage in chess, you try to grow that advantage and destroy whatever good things your opponent has in the position. So in this case, our advantage is space. So there are two key aspects for en enhancing our space. One is to further advance our pawns if possible, and the other is to avoid exchanges. So the genius behind knight e5 is revealed just by uh, examining that statement. This move simultaneously avoids an exchange, yeah, and it promotes an even oh, further pawn advance. So this move is excellent because it combines all the important elements of the position in one move. So we can't just pick any move. We have to pick a, a cohesive plan that's in keeping with what type of advantage we have. So they played bishop h5 and then b3 solidifying c4. And when black played knight d7 to bring the knight um, back to where it belongs, they played bishop b2. So they only traded the knight in the most favorable way. Uh, they didn't really want this knight on f3. They mm -hmm. want to play f4. Um, so here they traded. And usually people would say, if you're down material, you don't want to trade. 
but if resisting trading is going to lead to your position withering away, then there's no reason to do that either. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So they met knight d7 with bishop 2 c3. And how would you respond to bishop f6? Um... Obama e my change asked us if we're accepting challenges. Right now, Obama e my change, we are analyzing a game played by David Brunstein, which is why our uh, study is called Brunstein is ballsy as fuck. That's what's going on here. We're checking out a game where he sacked a piece for nearly nada and uh, wiped them off the board. But we may accept some challenges afterwards, depending on our time frame. Anyway, um, feel free to give uh, your input on this game. And uh, hope you can check out the, um, the, the conclusion of our game show earlier today. He says he doesn't know who Brunstein is. David Brunstein was a, a famous player in the... 1950s, around the time when the first Grandmasters were ordained, things like that. Cool guy. Solid chess player. And we're just checking out a cool game that that guy played. So, e5 doesn't work out. Correct. You just sacrifice your spatial advantage in one shot. Um, And preparing it with rook e1 is too slow. No, wait. Why is it too slow? It's because they'll go for the exchange. Okay, but can you reasonably trade. exchange? Can you reasonably avoid exchanges? No, not really. So then, why resist it? That's true. Which rook were you going to put on e1? The f rook. But isn't uh, the f rook supporting? The a rook actually. Yeah. yeah, you want to push f4. A rook is better so. because the f rook is supporting f4. Yeah. In both my games today, I actually ended up moving the a rook to the e e file. There's a common superstition that. You should just put whatever rook is closer. And the reason that that heuristic makes any sense at all instead of being complete and utter garbage is because um, whenever you use the closer rook, it means that the other rook has a greater number of squares to choose from, yeah. which means that there's a greater likelihood that your mistake of not even thinking about your move will go unpunished. You know, you might be able to pick one of those good squares. But if none of them are good, then why would you... Do that in the first place so you really do have to think critically about which rook to choose mm -hmm. nerf russian says just push f4 but right now our queen is hanging so how do we deal with that before we go on to uh freddy's bill and push that f5 what should we do first move the queen somewhere to Perhaps avoid the exchange h3 that seems like an odd place for the queen probably they'd play like it is but it's a double attack is it not oh that's fair Queen h3, double attack. Hmm. Yeah, Probably they have some kind that? of double defense. Yeah. But. Actually, yeah, we can open this up for everyone. How do you respond to queen h3? Is that a, a great move or no? Obama eat my change seems to agree. Yeah, what's the. Uh... <laughs> what's the rub? Yeah, there has to be some rub, right? Yeah, I think that there there is a, a good reply. Okay. After that, but. What do I know? I'm just the just host. The host. <laughs> <laughs> Nerf Russians is suggesting that we push Edward. Edward Epon. Yeah. Ed, Ed, that looks good. That, that was my second um, idea if Queen H3 doesn't work out. But why doesn't Queen H3 work out? I know there's something. They, they played this. Um. Let's see. Let's see. What's the double? Is there a double defense? Or is there some other justification? Um, okay, maybe it's not a straight up double defense. Maybe there's like some some tactical, tactical defense. Yeah, entirely possible. Would they play queen c three, threatening the knight, perhaps? Nerf Russians is suggesting queen h3, queen f4, threatening the knight. Um, we have several ways of threatening this knight as a counterattack, yeah. right? We can choose among any of these options. Mm -hmm. Well, no, not that one, sorry. What's wrong with the... the queen will just take it. Oh, yeah. But this right. one, uh, these are all not transparently bad. But we can knock them out one by one. For instance, um, queen g5 is met by f4. Ooh. Which you wanted to play anyway? No. Yeah. 
so that's not good. We shouldn't try to do a counterattack by encouraging them to play a good move. So that one's out. Um, if they play queen f4, this is not so bad. But maybe they can keep improving their position with a move like rook e3. They can block. Yeah. Um, so maybe queen f4 is viable. Queen b2 also seems interesting. It's attacking two things. So if, for example, they choose the knight, we take their knight. They take our pawn. We take their pawn. You know, maybe that's... Maybe tit. that's good. Yeah, tit for tat, as they say. Mostly tit, one would hope. <laughs> um, but queen d4 is also interesting because this move um, prevents f4 altogether. So maybe that's good. But it's not as forcing as the other ones. So I think it's kind of like you could just take your pick among uh, these three legitimate counterattacks on the knight. It's worth mentioning that in the queen d4 line, if they play knight f3, we just snap it off, and that's how we save our bishop. Mm -hmm. If they try to maintain the attack, we just go for the kill. Um, anyway, that being said, um, they played e5, avoiding all those things. Obama UI change says that they missed uh, the bishop takes f3 move in that sequence. So I guess that's good that we showed it then. So e5 was played. Bishop f5, I'm sorry, queen f5, f4, bishop g6. It's interesting how the pawns are all just uh, sort of spreading out and... and erecting a massive fence, yeah. uh, preventing black from doing anything with their presumably higher value pieces. Strength in numbers. It's starting to look like a horde game or a brief history of Mongolia. Yeah. All right, so 94, um, rook b8. <sighs> What'll it be now? What should we do? Who could it be now? <laughs> All right, so what's the logical progression of our concept here? I mean, Obama eventually you just want six. Ninety-six. Yeah, but what's our plan before we start looking for moves? Like, what's the plan here? We've been consistently grabbing space on the entire board for like twenty-three moves. <laughs> yeah. Um, very consistent. Um, so how do we? How do well, we except for up? the fried liver, that doesn't really grab space directly. That's true. Just let into something. Um, Obama even changes his e6 rar. The rar sentiment is always appreciated. E6 rar. The pawns Opening are up the attack knight. mode. Yeah. I like knight d6. That's kind of like. But what's the plan? Like, why do we do that? We shouldn't do any move without know. a reason. <laughs> Just doing it to do it, I'm sure it feels great when you win, but when you lose, you don't know why you lost. So we should at least yeah. have some okay. expectation of like what the plan is and why it might succeed or fail later on. I mean, it's taking advantage of those squares that we're defending with our pawns. What move will they play after knight d6? Well, I'm not a psychic, but <laughs> I can make an educated guess. We could roll an eight ball and see. <laughs> yeah. Eight ball, what are they up to? It says you will have to wait. Okay. So they're gonna play a waiting move. Potentially. <laughs> Good things come to those who wait. Nerf Russian says h three to push on the king's side. H three to push on the king's side. So he identified a plan, then he yeah. chose h three in order to do it. I see. There's an even better way of affecting the same plan. And the G four? The no, because no. they can just take it. But the way that you know is that after knight d6, hold on, they play queen f3. Okay. But if you play knight d6, they'll play a move like queen d3. Actually, maybe even queen c2 is stronger. And this is kind of annoying because we're threatening to capture a pawn. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like there's a simple way of defending that pawn. So you might have to trade. But if you trade, even if you have a lot of space, if you don't have pieces to guard that space, and if you've alleviated black space problem by trading, you just might kind of have an empty shell when you're done. You know, like a lot of pawns out there, but not much going on. Yeah. So keeping the queens on is important. And for that reason, it makes a lot of sense to play queen f3, because this is both preparing g4, the same thing that um, Nerf Russians wanted to do, and it also avoids the all that stuff. So let's see, what do they do in the game? I don't have this game memorized yet. Um, I've only looked at it once before. I just kind of suddenly remembered it when we were preparing for this. Um, so bishop h7, g4, queen g6. I think you could probably guess the next move with ease. 
F5? Absolutely. <laughs> it's interesting to note that they could play knight takes e5 here, but it's not tactically justified. Because after knight takes um, e5, they have a very neat move. What do you think it is? Who's they, white? Yeah, white after knight takes e5. Take the queen. But then they'll take with check. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Oof. That is check. I didn't even realize. Boom. And you'd have to take and... And then they would take the point. Yeah. And then okay. our whole spatial thing is... I missed that that was check. So... Um... I mean, this is probably not bad. It takes c5. You know, we, we have a small material advantage. Playable, but... Still. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could do, like... Knight f6 or something wacky like that. I swallow follow. No, Thanks for the swallow, I swallow. <laughs> swallow follow. What's going on? Seems like a swell fellow, this I swallow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think another option after knight takes e5 might be... Queen f4? Just to move like this. Oh, queen g3. Actually, um, no. Sorry, then queen takes g4. My bad. I was mistaken. Probably just um, pawn takes g6 is better. Wait, after... Oh, never mind. It's checked. The reason I was yeah, concerned is that you can't do this. It's pinned. Yeah. So that was my bad. I originally thought that that would be stronger. Anyway. Um, so we take the queen. All is good. So in the position, uh, instead of knight takes e5, they played... Wait, you take the queen. All is good. Oh, it's fine. It's playable. Yeah, it is but playable. It's You're up. Like... Okay. All right, so they play queen b6, um, queen g3, and f6. What a desperate-looking move. This is just kind of playing into white's hands. Obviously, they played e6 mm -hmm. and knight e5. Look at that triangle. I know. Part of why I chose this game is because a triangle of doom is effectively maintained. All right, one second. Let me just do the, the chat thingy. Ice Swallow explained his username. He said it's named after the Arctic bird Ice Swallow, and uh, he he wanted to have the the word seaman as part of his username, like a a seafarer. Okay. Um, but seaman was taken, so he used seaman as the second part of his name. I see. It all makes sense now. Alrighty. So they played F six and all that jazz. It's not so swell. Freeform or like. What do you think? Jazz fusion. <laughs> Yeah, all that jazz. I was thinking more like Broadway. So, um, what do you think is the the next way to advance our very logical plan? H four. Absolutely, that's what he did. <laughs> we're playing like Brunstein now. Anyone who's just coming in, we're doing a game analysis. We're checking out um, this game between David Brunstein and uh, another guy with a interesting name, Ernst Royan. Um, and this game happened in 1956 in a qualifier tournament. Anyway, um, back to the moves. So h4 was done. Indeed. And black is kind of reduced to aimless shuffling. So probably we could just go through the rest of the game real quick. King h8. Um, can you play the moves? g5. Yeah. Rook, a, uh, rook b to c8. What? <laughs> Let's try to guess white's moves, though. As we go. Okay. Um, anyone want to guess White's move here? Feel free. You included. Um, imagine G6. No. Imagine how pathetic that bishop would be. But, yes, but... But also, if you block the whole position, maybe you can't win anymore. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you have to get through your own wall. Uh-huh. You can't take your own pieces. Yeah. That's the problem. If you could, like, soak them out and make them take your pawn, that would be fantastic, but you might not be able to. Have you ever seen that famous uh, study where you're down like massive material and all you have is a queen, but there's this big pawn fence with only one way through and you sacrifice your queen on that square where they have to go through in order to close the wall? Have you ever seen that before? No. I'll try to find it and uh, maybe we could show it on stream. It's really funny though. You have only one piece left and you put it on the only entry square so that when they capture it, it makes a, a two pawn thick barrier across the entire king side, queen side, and center. Mm -hmm. So in a position like this, where it's not completely blocked, you have to be sort of aware that if you block it too much, you can't break through anymore. What about like... Mm, 
Nerf Russians. That actually. Nerf Russians is suggesting King H1. Um, Nerf Russians, why are you uh, keen on this particular move? Obama E might change wants to play D6. Uh, more spacey move. Yeah. Rar, presumably. Uh, there's also G takes F6. This might be what was that? What was the name of that like fool's tactic or whatever? Which one? The one where you do something fancy just for, oh idiot tactics. Yeah, the <laughs> idiot tactic. What's uh, the idea? Oh, you just want to threaten me, basically. Yeah. It destroys your spatial advantage though when you trade those pawns. Plus, it opens up your king. Well, you can win a pawn though. How do you win a pawn? So, G takes, G takes, Knight takes, Rook takes, Queen takes, Knight. So, you said, basically... Yeah, play it out. Pawn takes F6. Pawn uh -huh. takes F6, Knight takes F6, right? Yeah. What about this? Ah, uh, that's scarier than like, I like, remember. Like I said, your, your king is open. They could take... <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. But this I is kind of like I don't know where where's the where's the advantage now? You have two rooks against a queen I, and a bishop, yeah, and you, you do have a lot of pawns. But why give them any counterplay? Nerf Russians was correct about um, king h one, so I gave him some currency. Oh, okay, cool. Preventing any funny business. Obama well, email change was suggesting. What is it prepare? So... Well. It's preparing what you said, because oh, okay. now the king's not aligned with the queen. I see. So this conversion step is uh, a little tricky. So they supported f6 more. And only now he played g6. Oh, actually, here he sacrificed his bishop. My bad. Uh-oh. Because it's bad uh, when you have to sacrifice the bishop. Yeah. For now desperate crazy counterplay. Tactics. Then we played b5. So here it's basically all over. So let's just play the moves. d6. Is ignored it completely. D6. For the space. Uh, queen B6. D7. Knight takes D7. It's desperate now. Uh, pawn takes D7. Rook C D8 to avoid losing the rook. And then finally, the killing blow. Let's see if anyone can find uh, the killing blow. The game was over in two moves from now. Crazy. Okay, let's see what we got. Yeah. Anything jump out to you right now? Any tactical stuff? Obama yeah, email changes saying queen d6 maybe. I would love for um taking on f6 to work, but it, it's like one piece too short every time. Are you sure? No. Maybe there's more than one reason you might play knight f6. What do you think? Knight f6, what what did you imagine them playing? Rook takes. Okay, and then you would play Rook takes and then Queen takes. And then And then you're that's, kind of that's it. I mean getting them to take with that pawn is like the idea I had. You're right. If they take with a pawn you play g7. Which, that's fantastic. Yeah. But what if there's another idea? Like another thing that you change in the position after knight takes f6 that could lead to victory. Like some reason why they have to play um, pawn takes f6. Oh, maybe e8 afterwards. Rook e8. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Rook e8. So in the game, they played knight takes f6. Nerf Russian suggested rook takes f6. Um, we should check that out in a second. But first, yeah. I'll just show the end of the game since it's 9. Queen c6, check. Queen g2. And they, and they resign. <laughs> um, so if you play rook takes f6, I think it is just as effective. Um, because if they try something, I don't know, schmancy. Well, maybe after rook takes f6, they can play pawn takes f6. Yeah, and then after g7, what happens? <laughs> we'll just run away. Yeah. Because we sacked a rook, they can take a rook back. This position is still winning for white, though. There's no reason not to play something like... Um, rook f1. I was thinking maybe something like this. Oh, okay, that works too. And if they play knight take, uh, rook takes d7, probably they're in for uh, a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's several main threats here. Um, and they have no stalemate tricks. So knight takes f6 is more precise. And they just 
give the good old resign right here. Wait, okay. And then what? You can't play this anymore. Rookie seven. They're in complete sweet oh, spot. Yeah. Okay. I think that this is probably lights out. Yeah, what happened? An here, another thing is maybe we don't even need to play rookie seven. Yeah, actually, what's the most accurate follow up here? I guess we should discuss this. Nerf Russian says, but why Bishop takes g6? That's a good question. So even more critical than how do we finish here, where I think the position is just generally very good. Um, in the position where we play g6, why Bishop takes g6? That's a fine question. What happens after Bishop g8? Oh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so let's analyze this. Okay. I think I have an idea, and it's a tactical idea, but I think that we should all examine it a little bit deeper. Hmm. Slurping's not going to solve sound, the problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's take inventory of uh, the positive and negative things in this position. Okay, because... actually, knight f6, yet again. Yet again. <laughs> yeah. So, see what happens. if they take with the pawn, then probably this. Yeah. And that would definitely be winning, right? We can just take that and make it a pony or anything. Uh, couldn't you mate? <laughs> no, the knight's guarding. Oh, yeah. Okay. But in this position, we also have rook takes e5. So, maybe we maybe we do have a mate. Um, like this. Mm -hmm. So, you are onto something, for sure. We could, we're at least getting our piece back with a tremendous position to boot. Mm -hmm. um, they could do queen takes instead of... Instead of, oh yeah, that's Instead right. So they could play rook or queen takes, but they both run into the same problem. Rook takes, that's okay. We just take back the piece. Yeah. So we want a pawn. So I think they would rather sacrifice one of their useless pieces for a couple of pawns to get some counterplay than to just sit idle in a position where they're down material and can't move. Well, here, I guess they're not down material, are they? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three pawns for a minor piece. So, so it's even. technically like equal, but I don't but believe that in that. Bishop is useless. Yeah, so there's some big quotation might marks. As well not even it's even it. more useless than a pawn, actually. Yeah. It even gives you some risk of being checkmated to just have that bishop on g8. Um, any hoozle. Um, any other points that you guys think are really important that we should go over? Do I have to save this or something? Save. Boom. I think that was just settings, though. I don't think that was the moves. I think just whatever we played here is... Maybe that's just added done. to the setting. Yeah. Hopefully. What does sync do? It means that everybody can see our position. Oh, okay, okay. So if I open the study on my phone... Yeah, you'll be in the same position as me. I see. Obama ate my change missed the opening. Let's actually um, give a quick rundown okay. again of the whole game. So um, the long and short of it is that they played a fried liver attack but Bronstein chose um, a rather solid continuation instead of getting grabby and playing bishop b5. And after h6, knight f3, e4, which deflects the d pawn away from the bishop, he just boldly took it, which is why we we're talking about how ballsy he is. Because this is just basically dropping a bishop, right? He has two pawns for a bishop, but it's hardly compensation most of the time. But he was able to quickly... Um, create a great wall. Good night, Nerf Russians. Um, and once that great wall was erected, um, it was nigh impossible for Black to break free. Um, and that's how we got this. Um, this was a really critical moment. Knight e5 is simultaneously avoiding exchanges and promoting the general expansion of the pawn structure. So that was a really critical move. Instead of a move like rookie one, which doesn't go in line with that, or move like b3, which probably allows some favorable trades. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that this bishop is the one that got tra that got trapped later on in the game. It has very little maneuvering room, so allowing them to get rid of it immediately would be an issue. I can't believe it made it all the way to g8, actually, now that looking at it. Yeah, really. <laughs> that went from c8 to g8 and just rotted there until it got trapped. <laughs>
Obama ate my change to said, who are you to nerf Russians when he said, see you at, at the club. So we're about to have a <laughs> identity a, crisis, a, a real life reunion of people who never had a union. So it's, what would you call that? A meeting. I, yeah. <laughs> people meeting each other for the first time via, because of our stream. Isn't that sweet? And then the pawns really just rolled in like a derecho storm. And then Black lost their shit and started sacrificing all their pieces. And then this part, they oh, re yeah. did we, they, they resigned here. Did we um confirm what the best continuation? No, we didn't. Be? Um, so Queen G two, King G two, Pawn takes F six. I was suspecting it's Rook E seven, but it's not necessarily like Rook H seven. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have to keep in mind the possibility oh, wait. of so yes. after something like Rook, sorry after something like Rook B eight, you could do G seven. But why shouldn't they uh, take this pawn first? And then play rook b8. G7. But then, but then it's g7, right? Yeah. I'm just saying that, like, if we're gonna consider this, we have to look at it. But sure. um, these are both options: taking and then playing rook b8, or just rook b8. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, rook e7 comes with a threat, so they're basically forced to play um, king g8, and then we play g7, and I think that they're losing a rook. The rook has no squares. We got f7. Oh yeah, you're right. Got him. <laughs> So that's the main thing. Alrighty. What do you think? Yeah. Um, do you think we should call it a day or? Uh, I at least I'm going to call it a day. Maybe you could do like a couple of uh, viewer games since we seem to have had people wanting that. Well, I also need to go to sleep. Okay. That's so great. probably, I mean, not immediately, but it's a long drive. So I think that probably um, we're going to wrap it in here. Um, so thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, it was a pleasure hosting you. He says one bullet match. I don't even like bullets, so I'm gonna skip it right now. Sorry, but I owe you a bullet match since you did challenge me right now. Um, just remind me next time we're streaming that I I owe you a bullet game. Anyway, um, take care, everybody. Hope Love to see Vidania. you. If you like that, feel free to follow and subscribe and all that jazz. I'm if you want to be the next chess millionaire, yeah, only okay. subscribers can do the chess millionaire. So. Give it, give it the old subscriber try. Good night.